from St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. The very name laughing gas. This is something where you see it in the old black and white movies. They give people a dose of this and, and they start laughing. It, it does have this reaction for people. Yes, and it's that's typically in, in uh, concentrations significantly higher than what we give. Uh, the highest concentration we give is 50%, which is about what the dentist's office use. I'm just surprised it took so long to notice this antidepressant effect of it. I felt so good. I couldn't believe it. I'm Sarah Fenske. When Laura Healy's psychiatrist told her about a study at Washington University related to depression, Laura didn't hesitate to sign up. She'd tried many medications and other treatment methods over the years. Nothing worked. She was desperate for anything that might lift her depression. Well, the study at Washington University involved nitrous oxide, better known as laughing gas. But as Laura explained, it didn't make her laugh out loud, not initially. They took me into a room with a lot of cots and put me on a cot and hooked up, you know, EKG machine, all that. And the anesthesia resident came in and uh, gave me the nitrous oxide, which I just breathed in like you would oxygen. Um, And uh, I fell asleep. So Laura Healy fell asleep. Well, she tells us she didn't feel much differently right after she woke up. But I was talking to the anesthesiologist, and we were having a nice conversation and everything. Um, They observe you for an hour after um, the treatment. And then when I got up and went to my car and started driving, I felt so good. I couldn't believe it. Um, for one, I had no appetite for a long time before that. And I thought, oh, I'm so hungry. I could, I could eat a hamburger, and I don't eat hamburgers. And I felt good for about four weeks. And that is Laura Healy. And this was no fluke. Laura Healy participated in the second phase of the trial, and she again found relief. And it wasn't just her. Of the 24 people who participated in the most recent version of this study, 17 saw improvements. And here to discuss how this works and why is Dr. Charles Conway. He's a professor of psychiatry at Washington University and a senior investigator on the nitrous oxide study. So, Dr. Conway, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So it sounds almost like a joke using laughing gas to make people feel better. What first got you looking into this as a potential treatment? Uh, It turns out that uh, in the past 15 years or so, there's been the development of uh, another drug called ketamine that that has gotten a lot of uh, airplay involving. uh, It it turns out this is a... antagonizes a certain receptor in the brain called the NMDA receptor. And there's some... Uh, some of the people in our department, uh, Steve Manerick and Chuck Saromsky and others, for years have been studying different NMDA receptor antagonists, one of which was nitrous oxide. Mm-hmm. And turns out that somebody from the Department of Anesthesiology had been looking at nitrous oxide in animal models. So that person approached me, because my research is in treatment-resistant depression, and said, what do you think about trying nitrous oxide? So uh, about eight, nine years ago, we did our first trial using... Uh, one one single dose of nitrous oxide. That's the the, sto- the the first study that she was speaking of in that clip, and we we got you know very good response in a very very sick population. Um, so this most recent study was different dosages of of nitrous oxide, twenty five and fifty percent. So what do we know about how nitrous oxide works on the brain? Well, we don't really know as much as we'd like to know. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, this, for many, many years, we the, the vast majority of, of different uh, antidepressant treatments, like the drugs like Prozac and Zoloft and, and others, uh, act. we know that those act on uh, serotonergic and noradrenergic systems in the brain, and uh, to some extent, the dopaminergic system as well. But unfortunately, the, the treatments that uh, there's a, a significant proportion of the population, probably 15, 20 percent, who don't respond to these types of treatments. So... Uh, 
in the past 10, 15 years, there's been a big push to can we develop treatments that, that go after depression in a completely different way. And one of these ways is this NMDA receptor antagonism. And if I find myself thinking about nitrous oxide, the very name laughing gas, this is something where you see it in the old black and white movies. They give people a dose of this and, and they start laughing. It, it does have this reaction for people. Yes. And it's that's typically in, in uh, concentrations significantly higher than what we give. Uh, it's uh, we give the highest concentration we give is 50%, which is about what the dentist's office use. Uh, if you were to take 70, 80, 90%, which is not safe, because uh, you actually can uh, become hypoxic or not have enough oxygen, mm. then uh, it becomes a little bit less. Uh, you, you do get the sort of the euphoric reaction. The patients, most of the patients who have been in our trials will, will describe while they're getting the nitrous oxide, they're feeling calm and pleasant, uh, but they don't have like a, it's not a euphoric, like a, you know, silly reaction that you, you're describing. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Laura mentioned, the, the patient we heard from there in, in the introduction, uh, that she actually fell asleep. Does that happen to a lot of people? Yeah, a lot of people, it's very relaxing. A lot of people do uh, drift off uh, for a brief period of time. Most most of them don't. Most of them just kind of describe it as relaxing and comfortable um, and but we don't have too many people fall asleep. Okay, so you feel relaxed, and then for Laura, it was maybe within like an hour or so of that, she started to feel the impact of this. Yes, the, the, that's one of the things about, about these NMD antagonist drugs like ketamine and nitrous oxide, is that unlike the, the drugs which people take for depression, like Prozac, et cetera, which take weeks to work, uh, th- these newer agents seem to work pretty quickly, like within a matter of hours or days. Um, and that's that's what we've been seeing in in, in the the trials we've been doing is that, that similar to ketamine, which has immediate effect or relatively immediate effect, you see the same thing with with nitrous oxide. And these people that you've worked with on these these trials here, these are people who really other things didn't work for them. Study participants had failed an average of four and a half antidepressant trials prior to this. These are people who are very very depressed. Yes, and we we intentionally. Uh, targeted this population. We the first trial we did about eight nine years ago. We the average number of failed meds was eight. Uh, this particular trial the average was four and a half. Uh, so we took on you know a very sick population that was resistant to standard treatments. And because I it, we the way we looked at it is this is a this is not a treatment necessarily that that individuals who have sort of uh, common depression would necessarily want or desire. Um, but for people who have more resistant depression, were you surprised at the level of success then for this population? Yes, the first the first trial we did, looking back on it, was probably uh, we, were, we were taking on a very very sick population, so um, we didn't see as robust a response as we did this most recent trial. Um, so it, it definitely was surprising in both cases. I think the second the second uh, trial or second study was even more surprising in terms of the, the percentage of patients who responded. And were there any uh, big side effects here? That's always the rub for these things. No, it, it, the, the good news is the vast majority of patients tolerated very well. Uh, there was a, a small uh, subset of, the, pop, of the, the group that got the 50%, the higher dose, that developed nausea. We, probably the worst side effect is that some people seem to develop pretty severe nausea with the uh, nitrous oxide. And does that go on and on for the weeks you're getting relief or just an initial nausea? Just initial. Oh. Yeah. So once you stop the nitrous, uh, then you don't get the, the that particular side effect. And many of the patients, as when they got the 25%, they didn't know, the patients didn't know if they were getting zero, 25, or 50%. And the patients who developed nausea with 50% did not develop it with 25%. So A lower but, dose worked. Yes. We're talking today to Dr. Charles Conway. He's a professor of psychiatry at Washington University. Some really promising results using nitrous oxide, better known as laughing gas, uh, to treat depression, and particularly depression that had resisted previous treatments. If you have a question for Dr. Conway, our phone lines are now open. We're at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. And you can join this conversation. We did have a question from Mary on our St. Louis on the Air Facebook page. 
She says, has this been tested on both adults and teens? It's challenging to find depression treatment that doesn't cause weight gain. She also adds, can this be used for people with disabilities like autism? A whole lot of questions in there. Yeah. But she's obviously excited about this possibility. No, we haven't. It hasn't been studied in, in teens or adolescents, uh, children. We, uh, we anticipate that there will probably be studies in that. I, I personally am not going to do those studies, but I, I think it makes sense that it's it's safe enough um, where I think that would be a reasonable thing to study. In terms of autistic spectrum individuals, we haven't we haven't looked at that. We haven't begun to do that yet. Okay. Would this be the fact that you've got people coming in for a dose as opposed to having to get a, a pharmaceutical thing? Is this possibly less expensive than other treatments? Well, it it nitrous oxide is very inexpensive, which is nice. Um, it is not. Um, it's not widely available for purposes like this. Um, Would it be hard to get it available? I, I think logistically, that's something that my thinking at this point is that we probably need to be, we need to prove its efficacy in a, in a larger study mm -hmm. before we're, we're moved to, to do it in a uh, significant way in a clinical um, setting. But I think there's a, uh, I think because we've had two studies now that, that demonstrate Efficacy. I think there's a good likelihood that, that a larger tr trial would also demonstrate efficacy. And the difficulty of, of getting a hold of this, is this a matter of scarcity or just that it's not generally available to people like you to, to administer? Yeah, it it's, has to be administered in most facilities by anesthesiologists. Mm. It can't be administered or uh, dentists also have uh, access to that special training. So it, as a psychiatrist, I personally could not give nitrous oxide. Um, it's uh, in most facilities, different facilities have different regulations, but where I where I work at it, Barnes Hospital, has to be an anesthesiologist that gives it. Okay, so that immediately um, that ups the level of who needs to be involved, how expensive it would be, all of that good stuff. It is interesting, as you mentioned, the anesthesiologist, um, that this was something where you worked together with this anesthesiologist in the first place. Is that unusual to find a psychiatrist and an anesthesiologist teaming up like this? It is unusual. It is unusual. Our department's uh, psychiatry and anesthesia at Washington University have been kind of uh, working together for many years, and we... Uh, and the, the two anesthesiologists, Ben Palanca and Peter Nigelli, are both you know very interested in psychiatric illnesses, so it, it's sort of a natural fit. Mm. Well, our phone lines are blowing up right now, which I think speaks to the fact that there are so many people that, that struggle with depression or a loved one struggles with depression. This is such an important area. Sure. Um, let's go to Mary, who's calling from St. Louis. Uh, Mary, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. My question is, if a person did not get any relief from ketamine, is it possible that they would get relief from this nitrous oxide since it behaves in kind of the same way? Mary, that's a great question. Dr. Conway? I agree. It's a, it is a great question. It, we don't know. The, uh, I agree that from a, uh, intuitively you would think it, it wouldn't, the person would not have a very good likelihood. They're not identical. Some of the work that was done in, in uh, Charles Rumsky's lab that looked at specific binding patterns of, of nitrous oxide versus ketamine, they, they don't bind the receptor the exact same way. They both antagonize the receptor, but they don't bind it the same way. So it's altogether possible that, that patients who don't respond to, to ketamine might respond to nitrous oxide, but we really don't know. Hmm. That might be grounds for future study. I think so. <laughs> Let's go back to the phone lines. Kurt is calling from St. Louis. Um, Kurt, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Hi, yes. Thank you very much for taking my call. I would like to ask, uh, well, first of all, let me back up one second. I'm a disabled veteran here in town. I have uh, chronic pain and um, what you referred to earlier as treatment-resistant depression. And my question is, is there any way for me to get into such a trial as yours right away? Because I need help now. Kurt, thank you for sharing that. And I'm, I'm sorry you're dealing with that. Dr. Conway, we're actually hearing from a number of people with that same question. This, is, this would be a popular study. Um, is there any desire for, current or for more participants right now? At this very moment, I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have a current active study that we're, 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 we anticipate in the future hopefully in the next six months, we would have a study up and going, but uh, the, at, the, at this very moment, we don't. If people want to see if they can get on a waiting list or, or volunteer their services, what would you recommend they do here? 
Yeah, I think um, at some point in the in the not too distant future, hopefully, uh, if we're able to get a study funded to look at this, um, we would we could make available a contact contact information because um, I do think you know it, it, the next logical step I think is to do a larger bigger trial. And that's something you'd really like to do. I think so. I think it would be good to to demonstrate. Uh, once and for all that this is effective in a subset of patients. So for people who are interested in this, uh, let's just say, unfortunately, there's nothing that we can help you get enrolled in now, but we will certainly stay up on this subject. And and hopefully the people who control the purse strings um, will be excited about the fact there's so many people in St. Louis who are just calling out for this. I'm going to squeeze in one last phone call here. Um, This is uh, Jack calling from St. Louis County. Uh, Jack, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. A couple quick questions. One is, uh, I, I'm pretty sure nitrous oxide has been used for for decades. I think William James was used it maybe, and uh, I'm just surprised it took so long to notice this effect of it, this antidepressant effect of it. My second question would be, I think uh, several years ago, dentists were required to upgrade their equipment to reduce their exposure to it because there is a long-term risk of long-term exposure with it, and maybe folate uh is a good idea to take before you're exposed to it? Jack, those are two really great questions. Dr. Conway? Yeah, those are excellent observations. Um, no, the, the, you're absolutely right. There, there has been interest in, in the psychological, psychiatric uh, uh, responses to nitrous oxide for many years. No one's actually uh, aggressively or, or uh, carefully studied it uh, up until now, at least in a depressed population. Uh, there's a possibility that it could have numerous other beneficial uh, targeted diagnosis. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder comes to mind as something that would be worth pursuing, perhaps. Uh, the, your point about the, the exposure, the environmental exposure to, that's part of the reason why uh, at facilities like Barnes, only anesthesiologists are allowed to give it, is because it, it can, if you're chronically exposed to it, it could potentially cause some problems. So someone who's giving nitrous oxide could potentially be breathing it in, and that could lead to, uh, as he mentioned, B12. Individuals who have uh, addictions to nitrous oxide, where they're, they're inhaling nitrous oxide recreationally, have developed problems with brain. Certain regions of the brain don't do well when they're exposed to you know, frequent nitrous oxide and thought to be related to B12 deficiency. So, hmm. yeah, it's that's a, those are, are really good points. Uh, one last question I want to sneak in here before we let you go today, and that's, is there potential that a patient who's taking it this way without the possibility of euphoria, could they get addicted? Uh, you know, there, the studies that have looked at the uh, addiction potential of nitrous oxide are, demonstrate that it doesn't, it doesn't have the same type of, of physical dependence that a drug like ketamine does. Hmm. Ketamine's a, a pain related medication. Um, so the, I think the addiction potential is a lot lower. It does have recreational, it does, you know, people do use uh, like inhaled uh, mm-hmm. whipped cream containers um, for, uh, to get high, mostly teenagers, that type of thing. But it's, um, you know, the, the, I think the risk is relatively low. Okay. Well, there's so much that's promising here. Um, Dr. Charles Conway, professor of psychiatry at Washington University, thank you for sharing this. And then I hope you will get that funding to do the next round. All right. Thank you very much. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.